Coming up next on Art Rocks, the Alexandria sculptor called upon to create works of art for presidents of nations and A-list entertainers. I've been at this for about 60 years. In school I would just doodle things and rather than be paying attention to the academics taking place. An opera theatre with a mission to help train developing artists. The mission of the organization was to help the emerging professional artists to bridge the gap between the academic world and the professional world. Bringing a community together with the arts. So we really do serve the community, we serve the region. I think there's nothing else like us in the area. And we get acquainted with Sugar Rush Art. I'm inspired by cartoons and actual candy, the colors in candy, and the whimsy and kind of childlike feel that goes along with all that. That's all right now on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thank you for joining us for Art Rocks. I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. First up, meet Alexandria, Louisiana artist Morris Taft Thomas. His fans have included folks like Nelson Mandela, Alex Haley and B.B. King and just recently former President Jimmy Carter ordered one of his pieces. As you get to know Thomas's work, it becomes easier to understand its popularity. Morris Taft Thomas's work has brought him into contact with politicians, entertainers, and notable art collectors the world over. They've come seeking his creations in wood, clay, paint, iron, and other metals. The artist has excelled in everything he's tackled. But that success comes from decades of practice. I've been at this for about 60 years. In school I would just doodle things and rather than be paying attention to the academics taking place, I was sketching. I got disciplined quite a bit on that. I walk outside and look at the clouds and saw the cloud formation, the cumulus cloud and other clouds making shapes and making forms. And I'll get a piece of clay and look up there, man, and try to emulate what I saw in the clouds. Thomas's interest in art led to him being introduced to the great Louisiana sculptor Frank Hayden while Thomas was still in high school. Walking in the studio, I look at all those massive things in clay that he was working on. And I asked, could I touch it? He said, no, you're going to do better than that. He said, here's a piece of clay. He said, go apply it to the one I'm working on now. I was petrified, but I did it. And uh, from then on, I was, the bug bit me as to, you have potential of becoming a sculptor. Thomas went on to study art in college and later learned to weld, a skill that has led to the creation of some of his most visible works, like the butterflies swarming around this floral arrangement. This piece will be part of the permanent collection at the LSU Museum of Art. Another of Thomas's pieces is a permanent fixture at the LSU Library in Alexandria, and this one on display at Southern University in Baton Rouge. I tried to implement creatively in, in my sculptures, and especially metal sculpture, is to show movement in a static position. Uh, this is done by uh, uh, arranging the figure or the composition where the viewer will look at one section of one portion and the eye will inadvertently move around the entire composition. In doing so you'll capture what you want to do in terms of of uh, bringing out the movement within a, a figure that doesn't actually move. The dancer. Uh, that comprise 42 pieces of metal well together. It takes some skill, it takes some time. That is not just pulling the trigger. A delicate touch. If you get too close to it, it's going to burn all the way through. Thomas finds inspiration from many sources. The Lion Dance uh, was a vision of my seeing a group of 12 men on stage 
in Lafayette, Louisiana International Festival. They hunted lions, and so they did a lion dance, and the stump that they did would radiate, you could hear it almost a quarter of a mile. It was just that rugged. So what kind of sculpture would he create for the late South African president, Nelson Mandela? The magnolia, in addition to several masks that I designed for him, one in steel and one in mahogany. President Carter wanted the popular magnolia. I said, how large you want it? He said, Lord, you can make it. I said, I can make it as large you want it. So this was about maybe 18 inches uh, in one direction, maybe 19 to 20 inches in the other direction. We're in excess of 12 or 14 pounds. Thomas says he begins every piece with a sketch. It gives you an idea in terms of proportion, dimension, the size, uh, the value, the lightness of docks of the area, and also the scale in which you like to work. Many of Thomas's sketches evolve into portraits. I like to bring out the inward individual. It's not surface. I study the eyes, and from the eyes it tells you a lot about the individual. Uh, I can read a person uh, by looking through the eyes. Not at, but through the eyes. The curvature of the mouth and uh, the shape of the face, all those things are important. And so uh, the only other thing is to, to use value to lighten dogs. How you can put them in a particular light situation, how you can put them in a dog situation. Much of Thomas's work requires great physicality. All of it requires intense focus. It's drained me. I am depleted mentally. And sometimes I have to go and rest maybe an hour, two hours of drowsy and getting back to it. I'm a member of the National Sculpture Society in New York City. Uh, they communicate with me on a regular basis and always encourage me, Taff, you need to take part in this exhibition. And so it kept me going. Louisiana Governor Mike Foster once called on Thomas to design Louisiana's ornament for the White House Christmas tree. After the presentation, Thomas and his wife had an opportunity to meet then President George W. Bush and his wife Laura, an experience he says he treasures, even if he isn't a Republican. No matter where you live in Louisiana, opportunities to connect with the arts are everywhere, if only you know where to look. So here's a list of some of the goings on coming up around the state. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, visit lpb.org slash artrocks or pick up a free copy of Country Roads magazine. LPB's Art Rocks website also features an archive of previous episodes, so to see any segment again, just log on to lpb.org. Now we're off to Michigan, where the Arbor Opera Theatre in Ann Arbor is using opera to combat the stigma of depression and other illnesses. Recently, the group performed an adaptation of La Traviata with the goal of increasing awareness of mental health issues. Arbor Opera Theatre was founded in 1999 by three singers who had finished their schooling and were looking for professional level performance opportunities. The mission of the organization was to help the emerging professional artists to bridge the gap between the academic world and the professional world. For the first, oh, I'd say, seven or eight years that the company existed, the, that was really the focus, just how can we provide these experiences for singers and I think also to provide the community with an extension of the existing arts programming. We incorporated and produced our first opera, Lucia de Lammermoor, in 2000 and have typically done an opera each June along with chamber operas, recitals and cabarets throughout the rest of the year. AOT decided to do this particular adaptation of La Traviata to draw awareness to the stigma around mental illness that often results in uh, suicides. And we were influenced by the death of Robin Williams, and also some of us had experienced suicide in our own families. Oh, 
So the story has been around for a long time and when I looked at this story and I decided that we were going to be do doing this production, I really wanted to break it down and say what why is this story still relevant 163 years later? Why are we still, why do audiences still like it? It has this beautiful music, but there's more to it than just the music. So when I really broke down the characters and looked at um, sort of the archetypes of Violetta as the victim and Alfredo as the knight in shining armor and um, the father representing society and the forces that try to keep them apart, um, I realized that this story wasn't so much about a courtesan and tuberculosis and death, but more about the societal stigma. So as I updated this story, I really wanted to focus on what would be a societal stigma in our current time. And as I sort of queried with people and asked them what they thought that was, um, many ideas came up, but the theme of mental illness kept coming up over and over again. To tell the story in this way about something that affects so many people, depression, anxiety, um, you know, not just bipolar disorder, but any sort of mental illness, it's, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a profound thing to have someone in your life who's affected by those or to be affected by those things. Um, and to share that story through this incredible music, so beautiful, but to share this um, in a way, I think it's going to touch a lot of people and be a really cathartic experience for both those of us in it and the audience. I think the attraction of La Traviata is not only is it one of the most beloved operas of all time, but also it has themes that are readily transferable. So it's not just about a specific historical event or specific historical figures or something that was going on in history. It's about specific themes. Themes are more easily adapted to other, to modern, to different time periods. I actually knew the La Traviata story. I knew about its theme. I knew about the turmoil. I knew about Violetta's death, the stigma that kind of led to the problems that she had had with family members of someone she loved. And we needed to adapt it to the current day and age to change the story. So that was done with the goal of making it relevant to what the National Network of Depression Centers does, which is to attack depressions and bipolar illnesses. So in this rendition, this adaptation, she has bipolar illness, and that's what we're using, the bringing together of, of art, music, and science to really move us forward. The really interesting thing that I found out in working with some of the cast members is how many of them have, in their families or personally themselves, have mental illness. And it was really interesting to hear what they said. One of the, one of the cast members talked about how really emotional it was for her at rehearsals because this was so personal and this hit so close to home. Mental illness actually runs in one side of my family. I have, um, I have a, a grandmother who's bipolar, and uh, her sister was schizophrenic. Um, my mother and I both have struggled with depression on and off, anxiety. Um, when I was younger, I actually struggled quite a bit with, um, with cutting and with self-mutilation. Oh, that's kind of hard to uh, admit and to talk about on camera. Um, but what better place to, you know, to shake that for myself too than with this production. Um, that was something that for me was a long journey. So you have an illness that's treatable, but people are reluctant to often go get help. Why is that? Because there still is a bit of prevailing shame. We're making progress, but that stigma gets in the way. Uh, as sometimes I'm fond of saying, I don't like it, but stigma kills. And in some cases, people who don't get treated even get so much in despair that they die of suicide. So uh, we're trying to essentially use a medium of art and music to send a signal that moves people emotionally as well as scientifically to understand better while going into a framework of, I'm gonna be a voice to take these things on.
we know from brain research that music um, impacts another part of the brain and that people react to music in other ways and to art than they do just to spoken text. So this is a way of really moving people at a different level than they would be moved if they went to a symposium on mental illness or they read facts on the NNDC website or something like that. And inevitably this and other approaches like this are the way that you cut through stigma. We've got to talk about these things. I love opera and when I met when I met Sean and he first started talking about this production, I was absolutely mesmerized by the idea. I thought, oh my gosh, to bring together something that was so important to someone that I love so much, my brother, with what ended up killing him, it's just meant to be. And in looking at the finished product, it was a very emotional performance for me, especially the first time I saw it, it really hit home, which is why I think it's so important for people to see it. Traveling now to New York, where Troy is home to the art center of the capital region. For more than 50 years, the art center has provided a vibrant space for artists and community members to explore their creativity. Join us now as we go inside the facility and watch the artists at work. The Art Center has been around for 52 years, and it's a multi-arts organization. We have four galleries. It's a black box theater. And I was finishing up my hair. I noticed a small string on the hem of my dress. And classes in the arts, everything from culinary arts to pottery. We serve a wide range of ages from six-year-olds to 96-year-olds, and a wide range of economic backgrounds from people who can pay the tuition and those who need financial help. So we really do serve the community, we serve the region. I think there's nothing else like us in the area. One of the amazing things about the facility itself is the breadth of our programs. It takes you a while to realize uh, all the things we have to offer and that's been fun for me because um, I really love to work across mediums. So it's exciting to sit with our um, teaching artists and then devise new ways to kind of present the same old thing. We have a lovely woodworker. He really basically has been in residence here because he started to look across mediums, discovered clay, and then this thing has occurred because we gave him a little space when he wasn't teaching. I started two years ago. I teach uh, woodworking 101, relief printmaking, furniture 101, and visual fundamentals. The Art Center gives me um, great space. Um, a, it's an exceptional learning environment. There are so many mediums being taught so close together that all the instructors can are allowed to collaborate. Um, and it's just, it's really conducive to, to creating. The potters who has been, I guess, most dedicated to us as um, a potter is John Visser. And so we've made him our potter in residence. You know, if you just cone this immediately, the top can get really wonky and go all over the place. Bring it up. It was something we could offer him for all that he's given back to us. So those are ways that I'm trying to, you know, make the facility more open to artists and um, to pull in the local community. I'm trained as a sculptor, I'm a mixed media artist, and I traditionally work with non-traditional building materials. I'm lucky enough to work at the Art Center now for the next six months, writing an artist in residency program, which will be a new program allowing local artists or capital district artists to move into our space here at the Art Center, create a new body of work, and work to build a little community outreach. I was meeting with one of our teaching artists and he's a puppeteer. He wanted to actually learn how to make a stop motion film and to create the armature and the set. And so we gave him the space and made him our first artist in residence. And now we have just welcomed in Claire Sherwood, another local artist, 
and she, uh, part of her responsibilities is to actually develop that program and to make it more codified so then we can make out a call. Artists who have re um, residency opportunity will be able to move into the studio, have 24-7 access. Um, they can have access to any of the facilities here in the Art Center. The Art Center is really a really important um, cornerstone of the community right now, especially with all the education cuts happening in our public schools. I think it's really important for artists to be involved in the community, giving back to the community. It's part of our job as artists to kind of feed into that cycle of creativity and the Art Center is one place in the Capital District that does a really great job of that. If you can't come here and get excited, then I don't know, I, I, I think you should just try and wake yourself up because there's just so much to do here and so many different ways to, to make something. Bringing it back home now for our Louisiana Treasures segment. Many of us watched in awe the Academy Award winning movie 12 Years a Slave, which is based on a true story that unfolded in central Louisiana in the years leading up to the Civil War. A house closely associated with the film is open to the public, and if you're in Alexandria, a visit is not to be missed. This house was owned by Edwin and Malvina Epps on, by Beth here in central Louisiana, and it was built by, of course, the labor of their enslaved persons, one of whom was Solomon Northup. Uh, he was an enslaved person who'd been kidnapped and sold into slavery, and he'd been living here uh, with Mr. Epps for about, I believe, eight, nine years by that point, probably nine, closer to 10, because uh, he was here for a total of 12 years. And in building this house, he came into contact with the architect uh, in this Creole style, uh, Mr. Samuel Bass from Canada. Samuel Bass, he was an abolitionist, and uh, he and Northup got to talking. Northup told him about his family in New York. Mr. Bass helped him write and then smuggle letters to Northup's family in New York so that they knew exactly where he was. They knew he was enslaved. He had been gone nearly 12 years at this point. Bass was able to get those letters of Northup's up to Northup's family, uh, and a member uh, associated with the family was able to come down and present a case. They, it was a legal case. They tried it in the courthouse in Marksville, Boyle's Parish Courthouse, and able to um, ensure eventually uh, Mr. Northup's return to freedom. But if Mr. Epps hadn't decided to build himself a new house and had not included Mr. Bass, then Northup and Bass would not have met. Maybe Northup never would have re-obtained his freedom. He may have died here in slavery and obscurity. So it's really quite an important piece of Mr. Solomon Northup's story. The map was created by a former professor, Dr. Sue Egan, and a Rapids Parish surveyor. Rufus Smith, and they created a map to show the footsteps of Mr. Northup as he was here in Louisiana. So you can follow the footsteps that he took. This map is its a beloved artifact uh, here in central Louisiana because it shows so much of our history here. Uh, Director Steve McQueen picked up the book and started reading it and fell in love with Northup's narrative and realized what a, uh, it would make a good movie and he was correct. The movie is as good as the book. I teach Louisiana history every semester. I always use 12 Years a Slave as one of the readings for several reasons, one of which is that Solomon Northup was a free man and he knew what that meant when he lived in New York and suddenly all of that was taken away from him. So he could make comparisons that someone who grew up in slavery might not be able to make. And then secondly, it's important because it tells us the story of slavery from the slave's perspective. And we have very, very few of those because slaves weren't able to read and write. The owners quite often made sure that they weren't able to read and write. They couldn't leave behind the records, the letters, the diaries that the plantation owners left for us. We can know their side of the story. Solomon Northup tells us the slave side of the story. We have a piece of William Prince Ford's mill that Solomon Northup writes about uh, working in and we have uh, artifacts that are very typical of the sort of, of tools that uh, workers would have used, slaves would have used on a plantation during the, uh, the mid-19th century. 
Finally, there is something new to discover with each encounter with the work of Sacramento, California artist Jared Konopitsky. Yes, it's the rush of colour that first draws you in, but then take a closer look and you might discover that things aren't quite what they seem. When I sit down at a blank canvas or a blank piece of paper and the process that goes through my head is I want to take whatever happened that day, good or bad, and translate it into my world. And therefore I feel like I have a control in such a chaotic world. Someone described it and I love the term. They said uh, he creates sugar rush art. I'm inspired by cartoons and actual candy, the colors in candy and the whimsy and kind of childlike feel that goes along with all that. But there's also a slight darkness to it within the colors, the bright colors. So like candy's delicious and good, there's still a, it's not really good for you technically. I get a lot of mixed reactions with my work. I'll have kids that just totally get it. And they'll come up and I'm thinking they're just attracted to the colors, which may have brought them to it at first. But they get the monsters, they love the monsters. It's funny with adults, some adults do get it, but there's some adults that refuse to see the darkness. They'll see the light colors and they'll see it's adorable. And I almost have to point out, look, theres it's not all sweet. That confuses them at first. They'll buy a piece and sometimes they'll message me later and say, I did not see that there was this darkness happening or this monster that's right in that background. It's just a matter of what they experience first. You have these talents, why not draw whatever you want to? I'm not really worried about what are people are going to think about it. There's always just the personal thing that's going on with me that I'm just getting it out. Almost like, it's almost like therapy sort of. However, people will see it and they will translate messages to it and how they apply it to their lives and what they're going through. And I don't think it's wrong interpretations. I think all those interpretations are right. That's almost where the art becomes something new to me. As far as my inspiration with the dark side of things and the lighter side of things is I feel life is just full of that. There's so much beauty and ugly happening at the same exact time. So I put that into my work. When I first started this whole art thing, I never thought it can actually get to where I'm at now. I've had opportunities I never thought would be possible. I've had it in museums, I've been published in magazines like The New Yorker, and I don't have a specific goal. Just see where it goes. I kind of like the organic branching of it. I just kind of like seeing where it takes me. Sort of a destiny thing, I guess. That wraps it up for this edition of Art Rocks. You can always watch episodes of Art Rocks at lpb.org slash artrocks. And I might be biased, but Country Roads magazine is another great place to learn what's going on in the arts and culture all across the state of Louisiana. Pick up a free copy or find it online at countryroadsmag.com. Until next week, I'm James Fox Smith and thanks for watching.